When we think of the multitude of national parks in the United States, one name comes to mind before any others, Yosemite. Along with equally famous Yellowstone National Park, Yosemite represents some of the oldest protected land of the United States, or anywhere on Earth, for that matter. And today, it is among the most popular destinations for tourists hoping to enjoy some of America's most diverse and expansive landscapes. Some visitors, however, get more than they bargain for. You see, a look into the history of Yosemite National Park highlights not only how dangerous it can be, but how little we truly know about our own world. Out there, beyond the safe confines of our own cities and towns, the wilderness remains just as wild and weird as ever. In 1864, President Abraham Lincoln signed a law preserving both California's Yosemite Valley and Mariposa Grove for future generations. This made Yosemite the first legally protected swathe of land on the planet. The park is dominated by Northern California's Sierra Nevada mountain range, boasting some of the largest, tallest, and most impressive granite monoliths in existence. Around their bases sits a rugged frontier replete with waterfalls and forests and a robust, active ecosystem of flora and fauna, including massive sequoia trees. If the stories are to be believed, however, other things might hide in the shadow of peaks like El Capitan. Over the years, tales have emerged of truly miraculous, even unbelievable things unfolding right here in the national parks. And Yosemite is no exception. Yosemite National Park consistently attracts enormous crowds. In fact, the largest year on record was 2016, which saw more than 5 million visitors passing through its gates. Even during the pandemic of 2020, when park attendance dropped dramatically, Yosemite still managed to welcome 2.27 million tourists alone. And with so many people coming and going, accidents are bound to happen. Most are mundane and completely predictable, but mountain climbers fall, hikers sprain ankles, and wildlife behave predictably enough when defending themselves from overly curious tourists. Yet, amid these foreseeable incidents, a few tragedies do stand out as more peculiar than the rest. Among these are a handful of disappearances which seem to suggest something sinister might be unfolding at Yosemite. One of the most perplexing incidents involved young Stacy Aris, who was attending Yosemite National Park with her father and six others in July of 1981. Stacy, who was 14 years old, arrived with her party at the Sunrise High Sierra Camp on July 25th and was eager to refresh herself on an afternoon hike along one of the many nearby trails. See, she changed her clothes and grabbed her camera and asked her father if he cared to join her. He declined the offer, saying he was exhausted from the hike up the mountain, so she set off on her own. But little did he know, this would be the very last time he saw his daughter. There wasn't really any reason to be concerned. Stacy was not only experienced, but the weather was quite pleasant. The route she told her father she would take was simple and short, only mile and a half over terrain so forgiving that she didn't even bother wearing her hiking boots. Instead, she padded off in her flip-flops, setting off in the direction of a boulder not 100 feet distant, near the cabin where an elderly man named Gerald Stewart was sitting. Now, once she reached the location, Stacy talked a bit with Stewart and the two sharing pleasant observations while she snapped some simple photographs. She informed Stewart of her plans and in the affable spirit of any outdoorsman, Stewart offered to accompany her on the short trek down to a nearby lake. Other people staying in the cabins reported that they had actually watched as the pair set off onto the trail. However, it wasn't long until Stuart, who was in his 70s, needed to take a break. I mean, he wasn't as physically up-to-date as Stacy, to put it lightly. Stacy agreed and said that she was going to go on a walk just a little further ahead. So, just to go ahead and get the lay of the land. I would only be back in a minute. At this point, they were still within eyesight of the cabins, so everything should be fine, right? And both Stuart and more distant witnesses said they watched Stacy disappear behind some trees. And that was it. Stuart waited, listening to the sounds of the forest as the minutes started to drag on. Why hadn't his companion returned? 
with concern but little alarm. Perhaps she had been sidetracked by an irresistible photo opportunity. Stuart checked a little further ahead before enlisting others to help him find the girl. It was to no avail. Several passes along the short trail failed to yield any sign of Stacy, save for the lens cap of her own camera. After searching for an hour, the campers started to alert the authorities who lost a massive search and rescue effort. All told, 150 people became involved, including nearly 70 Mountain Rescue Association volunteers. Dogs and helicopters were deployed, but it was too late. Nothing was found then or since. No blood, no clothing, no belongings. Stacy had seemingly vanished into thin air. This was not the last time the Yosemite wilderness would swallow an unsuspecting victim without a trace. In fact, nearly 20 years later, Ruth Ann Rupert would tell medical professionals at a doctor's appointment on August 14, 2000, that she was going to spend the afternoon hiking Yosemite Falls. It was only going to be a short excursion, and she seemed to be in good spirits. However, Rupert was never seen again. Another immense search party was mustered, but no sign of her was found until 2008, when her backpack surfaced in an area known as the Fireplace Creek Drainage, an area searchers had scoured every inch of eight years prior, but nothing had ever turned up. Now, in 2005, seasoned hiker Michael Allen Fissery outlined a plan for his hike along Yosemite's Hetch Hetchy Reservoir leave the reservoir for Ranchira Falls, then to Tiltill Mountain and Lake Vernon until returning to where he initially started. Yet, for reasons unknown to anybody, Fissery apparently deviated from his plan, and when the 51-year-old hiker failed to return four days later, authorities then leapt into action. Like Rupert, all that was recovered was his backpack, found just below the snow line along the trail near Tiltill Mountain. A similar fate befell George Penka on June 17, 2011. The then 30-year-old man was on an 80-person church excursion when he vanished from his smaller subgroup of around 20 people. Accounts of exactly where and when this took place are contradictory at best, but it occurred in the vicinity of Upper Yosemite Falls, and to this day, not one shred of evidence has been found related to his disappearance. You see... Only seven years later, Max Schweitzer, a middle-aged government employee, parked his car at Yosemite's Camp 4, apparently walked off into oblivion, and his last known whereabouts placed him hiking somewhere in the park, wearing shorts, a sweatshirt, and a dark backpack. While there is some speculation that Schweitzer's disappearance was deliberate, as he had several run-ins with law enforcement, his ability to vanish from the face of the earth in today's modern era where all of our movements are somehow tracked and traced and databased remains shocking. So why does Yosemite National Park refuse to relinquish these individuals? Some believe these disappearances and other supernatural happenings, well, we'll get into a moment, actually stem from an old curse placed upon the land by Chief Tenaya of the Awanichi. Early settlers to the Yosemite Valley it came to resent the area's original inhabitants because, in their eyes, they were poaching off the land they had claimed. Eventually, the settlers resolved to forcibly remove the Awanichi from the valley in the 1850s and organized a posse led by Captain John Bowling to confront the tribe. Chief Tenaya and his people stood their ground, giving way to a bloody clash between them and the settlers. The son of the chief died in the ensuing battle, and according to legend, Tenaya looked one of the colonizers in the eye and shouted a curse, that should he be struck down like his son, the chief would haunt them in death. He would, in his words, not leave my home, but be with the spirits among the rocks, the waterfalls, and the rivers, and in the wind. Wheresoever you go, I will be with you. You will not see me, but you will feel the spirit of the old chief and grow cold. History departs from legend here, as there is some indication Tanaya died elsewhere, perhaps at the hands of another tribe, maybe. In any case, the curse seems to have taken root whether through actual magic or simply the power of belief. Since then, the sight of the conflict has seen an inordinate number of accidents, disappearances, and strange sightings, a phenomenon which has blossomed out to encompass the greater Yosemite area. Today, some even call Tanaya Canyon the Bermuda Triangle of Yosemite. 
even the official park trail guide map carries a warning. Hiking in Tenaya Canyon is dangerous and strongly discouraged. What happened to Stacy Aris, Ruth Ann Rupert, and the dozens of others who vanished into Yosemite without a trace? Where are they? Were they claimed by an ancient curse, or did something else take them? Something perhaps from the stars? On July 7, 1985, a man and his six-year-old son were enjoying their final night of camping in one of Yosemite National Park's many forested areas. It was roughly 11.30 p.m., and the father had decided to turn in for the night, snoring soundly in his tent while the boy enjoyed one last snack right before bed. The quiet of the evening was broken by an odd sound. Unlike any animal the boy had ever heard, it sounded like a strange buzzing or a humming noise. The boy, either brave or foolhardy, but above all curious, set out to find the source of the sound, a flashlight in his hand. After searching for about 25 minutes, he found himself atop a small hill from which he could see the surrounding countryside. And to his amazement, something big, perhaps 40 feet wide and 60 feet long, sat on the dried grass. It was egg-shaped, like a craft of some sort, about 40 feet away. It seemed to be the source of the humming. As the boy watched, he noticed the light streaming from what appeared to be windows in an open doorway splashing hues of various colors across the darkened earth. The entire area around the landed craft seemed mired in a yellow fog or mist, thick but not opaque enough to obscure a trio of short beings with gray skin, enormous eyes, and oversized heads. Each stood around three feet tall and seemed preoccupied with a dead ox or cow on the ground. To the boy's horror, one of these humanoids procured a shiny silver sphere. The ball left the being's hand and glided towards the animal's corpse, releasing a red laser beam that began slicing into the animal's flesh. It was too terrible to watch, and the boy scrambled to leave as he did so. He dislodged some rocks, now drawing attention of the creatures. They turned in his direction, locking eyes with the child. He would later say it felt as if they were looking straight into his very soul. The boy broke eye contact, fleeing off into the darkness, eventually finding refuge in a hollowed-out tree trunk. According to the entry from the National UFO Reporting Center, hikers and family members eventually found the boy. Still cowering inside his makeshift shelter, he was visibly shaken, but okay. And once he calmed down, relayed this fantastic story. Did the witness stumble upon a cat mutilation in progress? It would seem so, but unfortunately, little further investigation was conducted. If his tale is true, were these the same beings another camper saw in Yosemite in November of 1999? This hiker was alone, sleeping soundly in his tent when several presences, each four and a half feet tall, manifested in his tent. They communicated with him telepathically imbuing the entire experience with a peculiar, unnatural sense of calm. The witness claimed that these beings did not perform any intrusive surgery on him, but instead expressed concern about humankind's stewardship of the environment. According to his report, his next memory was of regaining consciousness at his campsite without any further incident. Perhaps something more recognizably terrestrial lurks in this corner of the California wilderness. Like practically every other national park in America, Yosemite produces its share of Bigfoot sightings, which comes as little surprise given its location is one of the most prolific states for such reports. Hikers regularly hear strange vocalizations attributed to the cryptid echoing through the mountains. In one instance, from autumn of 1976, Visitors were camping near Tenaya Lake, named after the same chief who allegedly cursed Yosemite all those years ago. And that's when they hear this low, loud scream right around 10 p.m. that actually ascended in pitch to a high wail. The witness had heard mountain lions before, but this did not resemble their cries at all. The possibility that they may have heard a Bigfoot is then reinforced by the disgusting smell they noticed at the same time likened to a dirty dog and the sound of something running past their tent at a very high rate of speed on two legs. 
Others have seen the actual creature close up, too close for comfort, in fact. In November of 1978, Robert Richardson had set up camp alone in Iron Meadow, about 2,000 feet below Iron Lakes, but above Yosemite's Fresno Dome. In the dim light of his campfire, he saw something immense approaching in complete silence. It stood eight feet tall and looked almost like a gigantic man. The orange glow of the firelight eventually revealed more details, broad shoulders, a thick neck, and a black bearded face that housed a pair of deep set in eyes and a wide nose with flaring nostrils. Richardson and the Bigfoot locked eyes for a few nerve wracking moments before he reached for his gun, taking eyes off the beast for only a moment. When he looked back, the creature was gone. Though he hadn't heard anything, nor did he find any evidence the following morning, Richardson seems to feel there was something unnatural about the encounter. His report noted the rich history of the Iron Meadow area, which, according to him, has yielded an abundance of Native American artifacts. Is there a correlation there? Anyone living in northwestern California on their way home from vacation might find their most direct route taking them through Yosemite National Park, especially if their journey takes them along Highway 120. Such was the case for one family on their way back from Nevada early one morning in the summer of 1998. Around 2 a.m., a family near Tioga Pass were startled to catch a bipedal shape in their headlights. It was covered in silvery black fur, perched on a rock by the roadside with a careful but deliberate movement. The Bigfoot raised its body from a crouching posture to stretch fully upright. It seemed to stand just under six feet tall and had a very thin build. The witnesses said it seemed as if the creature had been looking at something in the road before the headlights caught its attention. As their car passed by, its head turned to watch them. None of the passengers seemed in a hurry to turn around and to try and find it. Could you blame them, right? That fall, two hunters in the early morning hours were scouting for deer along Yosemite National Park's border when they noticed what they thought at first was a man wearing all black, slogging up a nearby ridge. The figure had no equipment, no light, no gun, nothing, but instead began digging in the brush for about a half an hour. The hunters thought this peculiar. Not only was the figure's behavior erratic, but they had been camped out here for 11 days and had seen no indication that anybody else here was in the area. As the sun began to rise after 6 a.m., the thing set off in the hunter's direction. It wasn't long until they realized what they were watching wasn't a man. By the time it had closed to 50 yards, they could see it was shaped like a person, but was covered in thick, jet black, shiny hair and had red rings around its eyes. Hoping to get a better look, one of the hunters quietly grabbed his rifle from the truck, taking advantage of the fact they had not been spotted yet. He pulls up the scope, but as he did, this thing darts behind a tree and never emerged. After a while, the hunters tried to find where the creature had gone, but could not discern any suitable hiding place. It was as if it had simply just stepped behind the tree and out of existence. Sightings are one thing, but what do we have of evidence regarding Bigfoot in Yosemite? While plenty of eyewitness sightings might involve the collection of hair or even plaster casts of footprints, there is some indication that a group of miners may, may have stumbled long ago upon the holy grail of cryptozoology, a Bigfoot body, or at least the mummified remains of a gigantic human. It was 1885, and a group of men were actually seeking fortune and fame near Yosemite's valley, Bridalville Falls. There was gold in them hills, and silver too, they believed, but their efforts had turned up little in the way of encouragement. It was on his lunch break that Mr. G.F. Martindale noticed a curious pile of rubble along the wall of a nearby cliff. Martindale, who was supervising the other miners, immediately recognized the pile as the work of human hands and would set his men to work to removing the stones. If the story is to be believed, the miners removed the debris in short order, revealing a fissure in the rock that had been sealed up by a stone wall. All present marveled at the skill involved, which consisted of layered rock, each an eighth of an inch thick. In fact, one miner declared it as pretty as any wall on that building that I have ever seen. Curiosity turned to greed, and had they stumbled upon a workable mine, or better yet, 
some overlooked buried treasure. Without a moment's hesitation, the mining party set to work disassembling the wall and had soon to open up enough to peer inside. The faint light from their lanterns barely revealed anything, save that there was indeed a space within. Once the rest of the stones were removed, their greed in turn fell to disappointment. There was no treasure here. Another adjacent chamber was explored, but the only thing worth noting was a long shape perched atop a stone shelf built into the rock. It wasn't the riches they had hoped for, but if the miners had any foresight, they might have grasped the magnitude of what truly lay before them. The shape was actually an immense mummy, around six, eight tall, and seemed to be swaddled in animal skins covered in a fine sheen of light gray powder. Unfolding the wrappings, the miners were able to discern that the remains were female and that she was clutching a child's body to her chest. His miners may have been disappointed, but Martindale apparently realized that the specimen needed to be preserved, so he had them dutifully package the corpse and ship it off to Los Angeles. There, it was allegedly examined by unnamed scientists who claimed that the individual must have stood over seven feet when alive and was substantially ancient, predating even the local Awanachi themselves. What happened to this priceless discovery remains uncertain, as with similar giant remains, allegedly unearthed from other indigenous American sites, it has been long lost to history, or perhaps molders in some dusty corner of the Smithsonian's Institute's collection. The only additional insight we can glean from the story comes from late Bigfoot researcher Bobby Short, who claimed that similar giants fill the legends of the Awanachi people. In one such tale, a giant named Ulelen descended into the Yosemite Valley long before white settlers, bringing with him a posse of other giants who engaged in open warfare with the tribe. Like other cannibalistic giants in indigenous American lore, Ulelen and his band of monsters delighted in abducting the Awanachi, taking them back to their lair at the base of Cascade Falls. Interestingly, there is a correlation here. In Northern California, many of the natives there refer to similar upright bipedal creatures that would come in their villages in the middle of the night, stealing their children and women away to cannibalize on them were referred to as mountain devils. While down here in Cascade Falls, they would strip them into pieces, dry them like jerky, and feast upon their flesh. Eventually, the Awanachi grew tired of this predation and eradicated the giants. Was the giant specimen recovered at Bridal Veil vale Falls, one of Ul El En's kin? Bobby Short provided some intriguing insight to her own retelling of the Yosemite giant story. According to her, the Awanachi left behind detailed descriptions of their burial rites. These included wrapping their dead in animal skins just prior to cremation. In 1990, she wrote this, If you recall, the mummy of the Yosemite Valley was wrapped in the skins of animals and covered with a fine gray powder. Ashes, perhaps. Today, Bridal Veil vale Falls retains a haunted reputation. Some visitors describe hearing odd voices at nighttime, barely audible underneath the roaring thunder of the waterfall. Awanachi legend holds the area is home to Pahono, a malicious spirit with a reputation for luring careless individuals over the falls to their doom. Pahono manifests in the midst of the cascading waters as a shimmering phantom beckoning travelers ever closer to the edge, until a misstep or a sudden gust of wind ushers them over the edge. Pahono is at least occasionally successful in this endeavor to the present day, as deaths from falling still occur around Bridal Veil vale Falls. We are left to wonder if the giant mummy of Yosemite Valley is somehow responsible or related somewhat to the tales of Pahono. The Bridalville Falls isn't the only landmark that is allegedly haunted. To the list of other strange phenomena in Yosemite National Park, we can add the ghost of Grouse Lake. This spirit first occurred in the historical record circa 1857 in the writings of Gallen Clark, who would become Yosemite's first park ranger 10 years after. Clark was surveying Grouse Lake's shoreline when he heard something absolutely uncanny emanating from the waves. It sounded to him like a lost or frightened puppy. When he brought the story to his indigenous colleagues, they informed him that such sounds were commonplace in the vicinity of the lake. 
They then explained the ghost of Grouse Lake was not a dog. However, it was the spirit of a Native American boy who had met his end in its frigid waters. Their people made it a point to avoid the body of water entirely, for they believed that anybody on its shores who heard the boy and investigated would meet the same fate. The specter dragging its victims by the legs to the bottom of the lake until they drowned. Paranormal author Brent Swanser related another harrowing story from Yosemite National Park, this one more recent. 26-year-old camper Christopher Thompson claimed that, after setting up his tent, he went in search of some firewood in the nearby forest, only to find an old man waiting beside his tent when he had returned. The man appeared to be Native American and wore around his neck a curious bell or charm which seemed to ring whenever he would move. The man explained to Thompson that he was lost. Would he be willing to give him a lift to the nearest road? Thompson was perplexed, but by no means frightened by this visitor. But at the same time, night was fast approaching, so... To him, the most prudent course of action was to not only take him to the road, but all the way to the nearest ranger's office. The man agreed, and the two walked to Thompson's truck. Instead of hopping in the passenger seat, the old man opened the rear door. When Thompson offered the passenger seat to his new friend, the old man declined and insisted on sitting in the back. The two set off down the road, and as the sun sank down below the trees and darkness crept over the forest, Thompson heard something. It was quiet at first, but he was able to discern bits and pieces. It sounded like some unidentifiable language, and it was coming from the back seat. Thompson spared a glance in his rearview mirror and saw the old man rocking gently back and forth, muttering to himself. Alarmed but with no desire to be rude, he rushed to the ranger's office as quickly as he could. Somewhere along the way, the man had vanished. At a complete loss for what to do, Thompson then reported the entire affair to the rangers, who didn't seem to be able to offer much in the way of an explanation or offer any help. There is an unsettling coda to Thompson's tale. He would later discover something in his back seat, apparently left behind by the old man. It seemed to be a small pouch made of animal hide and held a curious array of stones and herbs inside. Thompson claimed that Yosemite Valley locals told him the object was cursed and that he might be as well. Since then, Thompson struggles with nightmares, perhaps even sleep paralysis. Each time he dreams that he cannot move, the only thing he can hear is the strange chanting and mumbling in his ears. It seems that Yosemite is haunted both outdoors and indoors. The park features a few hotels where, if the stories are true, some guests simply refuse to check out, lingering long after they have left our moral world. The oldest of these, the Sierra Sky Ranch, constructed in 1877 as a rehabilitation center for tuberculosis victims. Within the confines of this sanitarium, the afflicted could find some respite in the crisp mountain air, quarantined from the rest of society. Over the years, however, Carrot Sierra Sky Ranch began to degrade, leaving many of the patients to suffer in less than sanitary living conditions. Eventually, the property was converted to housing for World War I veterans, then a lodge, a function it still serves today. Guests to Sierra Sky Ranch report a variety of unexplainable events. Among the most common apparitions are an angry gentleman who knocks over patio furniture as he prowls the veranda of the hotel, an invisible, amorous presence that kisses both bartenders and their customers on the cheek with unseen lips, and a woman reeking of perfume who haunts the hotel's library and main house. The children can be heard snickering, speaking in hushed tones, and running up and down Sierra Sky Ranch's many halls and stairways. Whenever they are seen, these ghost children tend to congregate in the common areas like the main living room and the media room. In addition to simply being seen and heard, the spirits have a reputation for generating a litany of poltergeist phenomena. They tug on guests' clothing, slam doors shut, and turn anything with a switch on or off, from faucets to appliances to lights. While younger, the Awani Hotel may even be more haunted than Sierra Sky Ranch, Named for the Yosemite Valley's original inhabitants, this majestic structure was completed in 1927 and boasts 97 hotel rooms, suites, and parlors stretching across 150,000 square feet alone. 
Y-shaped layout. It sits only a short distance from one of Yosemite National Park's most famous landmarks, the imposing granite crest of Half Dome. Even if you have never been to the hotel, you probably have a good idea of what its incredible interior looks like. When designing the interior sets of the fictional Overlook Hotel for his 1980 horror masterpiece, The Shining, film director and horror master Stanley Kubrick drew upon the Awani for inspiration. While vast, the interior of the Awani Hotel is rendered cozy by all the trappings we've come to expect from a rustic National Park Lodge. Massive fireplaces, luxurious animal furs, comfy leather sofas, and a warm yellow light spilling from dozens of chandeliers above. But don't be lulled into a false sense of security by these creature comforts. When you are a guest in the Awani Hotel, you are never alone. If you guys enjoyed today's episode on the mysteries surrounding Yosemite National Park, go ahead and hit that like button, leave a comment down below, let me know what you'd like to see next, or maybe what are your favorite moments from this episode. And if you're new to the channel, what's up? Go ahead and hit that subscribe button and make sure your notifications are turned on so YouTube can let you know every time I release a great new piece of content. As always, guys, I will catch you all in the next video. Stay safe.